Hello everyone and welcome to the final day of Havering Online Futures Week. Um, my name is Taylor and I'm going to be presenting this very special one-off workshop with Ella Sims today. So Ella is a performer, a writer and coach living in London and who has a long and varied history working in both education and the performing arts. So today Ella is going to be specifically talking about the subject of resilience. But before I introduce her and her workshop, I want to make sure that you've all completed the following before the workshop begins. So I want to make sure, firstly, that you've remembered to come prepared with this set to this session with a pen or pencil and paper, just so that you can not jot down any notes, any ideas, any questions that you might have for Ella. Secondly, and this is really important, I hope that you can all complete the mini survey, which is uh, just in the, the description box of the, the YouTube video. And then finally, please make sure that you take notes and take part. I really want everyone to get everything that they can from this session. Um, and in order to make sure that this session as, is as interactive as possible, we've also set up a Menti uh, Q&A link which you can see on your screen now. So please do go to menti.com and enter the code 138718 to ask Ella any question that she likes. I mean, if, I mean, please try and keep it up on the subject of resilience, but I'm sure Ella's open to all manner of questions. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Ella, um, ask her if she can come on video and she can start talking to you about the wonderful world of, of resilience. So take it away, Ella. Thank you so much, Taylor. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be with you today. Normally, at this point in this session, I'd be walking around the room because we'd be in person, asking you what you've had to eat today because I love food, and just finding out what is on your mind when it comes to resilience. So we're going to be talking about what that actually is in a moment. But before we do, I want to share with you one of my first experiences of having to grow in my own resilience. So I am a school leaver, which isn't always the easiest when it comes to employment. But I was so lucky that at the age of about 20 years old, this organisation had said that they trusted me to go into schools and talk in assemblies. Now, for me, this was really exciting because I love people and there were going to be loads of people in one room. And uh, I've got to admit as well, though, I was quite nervous because I've not done it before. So the organisation that I was representing said, don't worry. What we're going to do is we've got a video for you. So all you need to do is you need to go into the room, say hello, play the video, and then you can collect some forms and off you go. It should take about 15, 20 minutes. And I thought, I can do that. That's going to be fine. So here I am. I arrive at this school. Uh, it was, where was it? It was in Wandsworth. And I rock up. And the first thing that happens is the head teacher goes, ah, you, hello. Um, yeah, so there's some building works going on in our assembly room. So we're actually going to be using a different building. However, it doesn't have the capacity for all the students. So you're going to have half the time and you'll do it twice. So already I'm panicking, thinking, OK, I will probably have just enough time to do the video. Maybe I'll get them to collect their forms after. Ha, it's going to be OK. Oh, it doesn't feel okay, but it's gonna be okay. I then get into the room and they say, oh, by the way, um, the projector's not working. <laughs> and I just remember, and by the way, all the, all the girls, it was a girls' school, there were hundreds of girls sitting, watching me as I was setting up. And I just remember looking out at all these faces thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> this is terrible. But I'll tell you what happened. I just was honest. I said, hey, everyone, uh, my name's Ella. I'm meant to be playing a video today, but it's not working. So I, now I'm really nervous because I'm not meant to be talking to you. And here we are. And I've got to say, it was 
very nerve wracking. I, I went bright red. I was the color of a tomato, not a not an attractive tomato, like a big, juicy tomato. But I survived. And actually, even though that experience wasn't how I planned it, the results of it meant that I grew in confidence. I recognized that things wouldn't always go to plan, but I might just be okay. And that was about nine years ago now. So uh, needless to say, I've run into so many problems. If anyone works in schools uh, or anyone who's been in an assembly and you've had a guest visitor, you'll know there's always things that muck up. But in life in general, there are going to be things that go a bit different, which we can absolutely tell for these current times. I mean, who could have imagined that we would be in this bizarre scenario? Um, I've spoken to the most elderly people that I know, and no one has seen anything like this before. So I hope that with that information that you already know, you know we're in a pandemic, you know we're in lockdown, I hope that you know that you're already resilient because merely by being here online today, you are demonstrating that you are ready to face whatever life uh, throws your way. So um, before we talk a little bit more about what resilience is, we're gonna be talking about what it is not. Resilience, in my mind, is not endlessly pursuing your goals until you reach them. So if you were hoping that this session would tell you how to stick it out on the way to getting that nice car or that big house or that designer, whatever, this isn't that session, I'm afraid. And I will tell you why. There is a wonderful author called Oliver Berkman, and he wrote a book called The Antidote. And in that book, he was talking about this bizarre human behavior when it comes to goal setting. Now, he was looking particularly at goal setting around climbing Mount Everest, because what he found was this strange pattern of behavior where people started identifying, their, identifying with their goals and would pursue them no matter what, with actually fatal results. So I don't know if you know much about Mount Everest. It's very big. It's also pretty dangerous. And when you're climbing Everest, if you're doing it for charity or because you're bonkers, then you will get a guide, someone who is experienced, who knows the weather, who knows the mountain, who's lived there, and they will help you in your summit. Now, what, what Oliver Berkman was talking about in his book was this crazy scenario where people were so devoted to their goals, so devoted to those external results, that even when the experts, the experts would say, no, I'm really sorry, we have to turn back, we can't do this today. They would continue against that advice and they would die. Now, there are over, to this day, there's over 200 dead bodies around the summit of Mount Everest, which is pretty scary, I'm sure, if you're climbing it and trying to get to the top yourself and you have to go past them. But I hope that demonstrates that actually it's not always about committing to a desire and, and thinking, I'm going to be less of a person if I don't achieve this goal. Rather, resilience is about dealing with the unexpected and knowing that you can bounce back. Now, for the rest of this session, we are going to be doing uh, a few activities. And I'm conscious that you've probably spent some time already with us and that you probably have been thinking about your academic career as well as your sort of adult career. And whilst your career is absolutely so important. It can dictate our finances, which can affect every facet of life. Also, it's going to be how we spend a lot of our time on earth, which is so precious. So your career is really important. But I really invite you just for the rest of this session to consider 
the rest of your world when we're talking about resilience and doing those activities. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, do you know Bruce Lee? I hope you know Bruce Lee. If you don't, you should check out his videos. I'm now just going to share my screen quickly. Oh, and share computer sound. Da -da -da. Yeah, okay, so this is Bruce Lee. Oh, it wants my password. This is my fault. I told, I told Taylor I didn't need any, um, any technical stuff and I was apparently lying through my teeth. Hmm. Please install. Oh, okay. No, that's not working. I don't know if you, you're probably not able. Okay. Can you hear that? Taylor, I can, can you hear, hear that? that? Amazing. Okay, so this is Bruce Lee. This is what it is, okay. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup. It becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. I quite like that. Um, so I, oh, it, then it's now playing lots of watery sounds. How nice. I'm just going to close that. So, um, yeah, I really think that encapsulates what it is all about. It's about responding to your environment and dealing with your reality. Now, um, the next bit uh, that I'm going to be talking about is from a phenomenal woman called Dr. Lucy Hone. She is a resilience expert who has studied this subject for about 10 years, and I'm pretty sure she's got a PhD in it as well. Um, but before we start looking at those things, I just want to remind you that your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health, they are all inextricably linked, which means they're all completely knitted together. So if you start following some of the guidance that I give you today, but you're not sleeping properly, you're spending a lot of time on a screen, which, which stimulates your brain and you're not getting nine hours of sleep, which is optimum for your age, uh, then it's not going to work very well. Same with staying hydrated, eating, exercising. You don't have to be perfect at those things, but just be mindful of them because this advice is useless if you're not looking after yourself. All right, so um, this is the first time I've done this session, by the way, so please do forgive me if I'm looking at my notes. Now, I'm going to share my screen one more time just for... Ha, 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 ha. There we go. Okay, can you see... Can we see that? Yep. Beautiful, thank you, Taylor. <laughs> All right, okay, so this is from Dr. Lucy Hone, who is much wiser than me when it comes to resilience. So her advice are these top three things. Now do get your pens and paper out if you haven't already. You will absolutely need it for the next exercise, but for this first one, I just find it really, really helpful. So, the first thing that Dr. Lucy Hone was talking about was that people who are resilient, resilient recognize that bad stuff happens. So we understand that adversity does not discriminate. That means it doesn't single people out to say, hey, some bad life stuff's going to happen to you. We all experience all kinds of challenges in life. And by the time we're in our 50s, 60s, or maybe even our 80s and 90s, not only will we have survived a global pandemic, but unfortunately we'll have survived things like failed businesses, um, the death of loved ones, the um, loss of jobs. These are inevitable to part of life. So please remember that this is not about creating a perfect life without suffering. Suffering is kind of inevitable, but it's finding that balance and recognizing that there is a, the opportunity for good within life. So resilient people recognize that bad stuff happen. And yeah, so I guess my personal belief around this as well is that I believe that there is kind of some bad stuff in the world. It doesn't matter what you call it. There's, there's definitely some bad juju around, isn't it? There's um, very negative things that we read about in the news. And I personally think one of the real causes of poor mental health and one of the things that exacerbates or makes things worse in the world is this feeling of disconnection. 
it's this sense of isolation that we are alone because there is nothing scarier than that. When we're born, that's our first fear. We, we are so vulnerable. We need to be looked after. So to lose connection is really stifling and makes us feel powerless. But when we recognize that bad stuff happens to all of us, then we don't feel as alone and we're able to reach out and to connect, which is all part of looking after our emotional health as well. Um, it also, kind of prevents you from thinking you know why me why did this happen to me and I've been there I think we've all been there you know whether it's a bad I was I was driving the other day just back from Tesco nowhere glamorous when I, <laughs> this was actually day before yesterday when I don't know what it was it must have been a flock of seagulls or something but they all dropped their droppings like there was I counted them because I'm strange there were 40 marks of bird droppings on my car 40 that's mad. So if I was in a bad mood, I might have thought, oh, no, now I've got to pay to get it cleaned. And oh, I'm so busy at the moment. And oh, you know, and I, it could have really ruined my day. But part of being resilient is kind of it affords you a sense of humor. So naturally, I laugh my head off when that happened because I thought, why not me? And that's going to really help you if you're looking at building resilience. The second thing that we're going to look at, if my slides work, is focusing on the good. Now, when I was a kid, so I grew up in a Christian household and we had a sort of embroidery poster type thing in our downstairs loo. And it said something like, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I'm still learning that. I think that's such a wonderful thing to aspire to, to do is to change the things that we can and accept the things that we can't. So um, what, what we're looking at here is it's, it's kind of about control. It's, it's surrendering this idea that we can control everything in our lives. Of course we can't. We can't as much as our technology has advanced, we haven't learned how to control the weather yet. And thank goodness, we'd probably ruin the, the earth and burn it to a crisp. But by focusing on the good, we're creating our own reality that we can, that we can reside in. Now, I really love, um, we've got a session on mindfulness that I really, really recommend that you check out. We've got some wonderful exercises in there. One of which, if we've got time in today's session, we're going to do it together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, we're going to be doing a mindfulness session at the end of this. But if not, it's all in that video, um, which you'll be sent a document as well after this video if you haven't already. Um, and it's the link for that is in there. But I suppose what we really want to highlight here is the way in which our brains are hardwired to look for the negative. Now, that, that's not because we're goths. It's not because uh, we enjoy being negative. It's an evolutionary survival thing. And Dr. Lucy Hone, when she talks about this, she says, imagine that I am a cave woman. I come out of my cave and to the left, there is this beautiful rainbow. And to the right of me, there's a saber toothed tiger. It is vitally important that in that scenario, we are aware of the danger of the threat. Uh, because otherwise, if we're so focused on the good stuff around us, then we're going to get eaten and we can't enjoy the rainbow either way. Now, the thing is, that's, that's a really easy scenario looking back at cave people times. But if we look at the current scenario that we're in right now in, in, in modern times, our brains have not adapted to the techno technological advances that we are experiencing. So every time that you get a ping notification or boom, flashing light or whatever it is, anything that's designed to grab your attention, that is going to set off a little bit of cortisol, which is the stress hormone in your body. And whereas when we see something that causes us stress or fear that creates a threat response, normally, I mean, let's say that we're crossing the road and a car nearly hits us. 
of course, quite naturally, our body is going to freak out. Our whole system is going to be flooded with adrenaline. But what's going to happen is when we see the car drive off, <sighs> we know we're not in danger anymore, so we can relax. Whereas when it comes to the other sort of virtual notifications and emails and pings and whatever you've got on your phone, it doesn't ever go away way there's not really that kind of satisfying understanding of the threat leaving so managing stress is really important and we're going to be doing a mindfulness uh, a mindfulness clip in just a moment um oh notes 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 mm -hmm. oh i like this one um so yeah the the resilient uh, people recognize that what we focus on matters. And my absolute icon is Oprah Winfrey. Do you know Oprah? If you don't know Oprah, you should check her out. She's absolutely enormous. One of the most successful women in ever. Um, and she says, uh, what we appreciate, appreciates. And another way of saying that is basically what we focus on gets bigger. So um, one way of switching your focus is something called gratitude. You might have heard about gratitude before. It's kind of another way of saying being thankful. And what's really interesting is there was this, there was this doctor in 2005. I'm going to forget his name. I think it was Martin somebody. Martin Seligman, yes, in 2005. And he got a whole bunch of people together. And what he did was that he asked them to simply write down, I think it was three things, three good things that had happened to them that day. And six months later, he went back to this group of people who'd been writing down every day, three good things that have happened to them. And what he found was that not only had their gratitude increased, but they were also happier and less depressed. So simply, these weren't three things that magically happened. It was just a case of noticing the positive things that had happened. Now, I, I find it easiest to keep a journal. So I keep, I just buy like a paper diary every year. And I write three things that I'm grateful for every day. And I've got to say, it really transports the way in which you see your days. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a human being. So there are still days where I feel down and where I'm grumpy and I don't notice all the nice things around me. But it is a practice. It's just like going to the gym and training a muscle. If you train your gratitude, it will get bigger. And you notice more and more things that feel almost like little miracles dotted throughout your day. Um, there's also, oh, here we go. Ah, now this last one. This last one is super helpful and very practical. These first two are a bit, um, if you're like me, they work, but some people like something that's a bit more practical. So this one's for you. Ask yourself, is this harming or helping me? Now, this is a resilience tool that is so flexible because we, we all find ourselves in patterns of behavior. Um, you know, for me, I absolutely love chocolate. Now, chocolate, I'm pretty sure is good for you in certain quantities. So asking myself if I've eaten an absolutely enormous, or maybe I'm on my second big Cadbury's dairy milk whole nut, is this harming or helping me? You know, and it kind of gets us to stop that behavior in its tracks. Another more common one that we see is scrolling through Instagram or following people who give us this picture of life that doesn't seem obtainable. Well, is looking at this and comparing myself and feeling less, is that good for me? Is it helping me or is it harming me? And that should enable you to make choices that help you flourish. Um, so yeah, da, 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 da. I guess, yeah, and I think what it comes down to, I, I sorry, one more thing on that as well, by the way, is if we are, if we are starving ourselves or if we are over exercising or if we're doing something that's born from a place of wanting to be more but it's not actually helping you this question will really help you be resilient and and go on from that now resilience isn't easy it's not going to remove 
all the pain from life. Um, but I would argue that this there's been a sort of whispering, I call it a whispering in our society and in our culture that we are entitled, not even that we can have it, but we are entitled to a picture perfect life. We are allowed to have these flawless profiles, these flawless life experiences. And actually, the resilient people among us identify that life includes suffering. It's just about how you react to it, because that is something that we can control. So um, before we move on to the next chunk that we're going to be doing, the next exercise, I guess, are there any questions that have come up? I'm going to give you about 30 seconds just in case you have any questions. I feel like doing a countdown jingle. Do, 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 Taylor, are we, are we no question city? We have one question that might be interesting, which is I've not done as well as I thought I would in my GCSEs. Mm. I wanted to become a lawyer, but I'm not now scared that I'm not going to be able to achieve my goals. It's not so much a question, but I guess a worry, um, which speaks to yeah. the themes in your presentation already. Oh, oh my goodness. So first of all, thank you so, so much for being so honest and open about where you're at. Um, we're really lucky that I happen to know a little bit that might be helpful just by coincidence. But remember, I'm not, uh, a le I'm not in the legal profession, so you might want to speak to somebody who is. Um, but the way studying uh, to become a lawyer works is that you can actually, you can study law or you can study pretty much anything else and then do a conversion course. Now, I would say, don't get me wrong, like I'm a failure. I'm an absolute failure. The dreams that I had for myself when I was 17, I've achieved pretty much none of them. And yet I would say my life is still worthwhile. I still experience joy. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're not going to become a lawyer. I'm going to suggest that if it's your heart's desire and if it's something you really want, then let's say you had to, it's not going to happen, but let's say you could only be a lawyer if you retook your exams a hundred times and you could only start your legal practice when you were 50 years old. Well, it's totally up to you, isn't it? It's like, is, do you love it that much? In which case, cool, great, that's awesome. You found your path, you're gonna be pursuing it. But it doesn't matter how badly we want something. We, we kind of all face these moments in life where we can be thrown off, of, off, thrown off our path or um, yeah, it, life just doesn't go as planned. In an ideal world, you'd have smashed your exams, you'd have already been offered a letter. In fact, a law school would have already knocked on your door and gone, hey, we've heard about you, just to let you know, we're gonna hire you and here's a 100,000 pound salary uh, for your starting year. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but things haven't gone to plan and that's inevitable. I know lawyers who, who make mistakes as part of their practice. You know, mistakes are gonna happen, obstacles are going to be in the way the trick is and it's harder it's so much easier said than done but be so radically kind to yourself build yourself up and don't wait for anyone's validation it's up to you whether you want to be a lawyer it sounds like you really want to be one so every every single career profession has so many people that flourish in that profession that failed a thousand times before they succeeded. In fact, some people say that failure is a part of the path of success. So maybe it's just testing you to ask you, is this something you really want? Or were you looking for a shortcut? Or were you looking for an easy route? Like, so what is it about being a lawyer that excites you? And uh, how much are you prepared to, to reapply yourself? And that's what resilience is all about. Mm. Cool. That's really good advice. It reminds me of that quote by John Lennon, which is life's what happens when you're busy making, making plans. plans. Yeah, it's, I think so it's really true. relevant in that, especially when you're at this age, you know, doing GCSEs, trying to just find your way in the world, um, attaching too rigid a, uh, a plan to what you want to do, whether it's at university or beyond. Um, you're kind of, I mean, you're setting yourself up for 
I don't know. I don't know if it's disappointment, failure. Um, you know, some of the most interesting people in the world don't decide what they want to do with their lives until they're 30, until they're 40. Don't, don't feel um, restricted by, um, you know, expectations for yourself, but expectations beyond yourself. Uh, be kind to yourself, like you said, Ella. Um, we've got one other question that is kind of relevant. Um, so what reading slash articles or even podcasts could you suggest um, to somebody who wants to learn a little bit more about resilience and some of these stories that you've been telling? Do you know what? That is so funny that you say that. I'm just going to give me two seconds because <laughs> I have over here... Now you can look up, literally part of being a human being is learning how to use Google, isn't it? And finding articles and things. Now, this is a book called Leader. It's Know, Love and Inspire Your People. And this uh, was written by one of my mentors and she again studies resilience. She actually studies flourishing, which is you can't flourish without resilience. And this book was released yesterday. Um, it was in, and funnily enough, how resilient is this? Uh, the, this book has been delayed by months and months and months and months, but all the money's going to their Prince's Trust. And what I love about it is it's got all of these chapters about basically about people overcoming all sorts of things. The first chapter, sorry, Katie, to be reading your book, um, but it's about these miners that were stuck. They had two days worth of rations. They, I think they were, they were underground in Chile for I think something like 69 days. So it's like, well, what leadership skills did the boss use and what, what, are the, what are the tools and things? And actually it's totally flipped on our head of what we understand it to be. Like in our culture, we really love extracting information. We really love exploiting, um, not just opportunities and exploit, exploiting has, you know, it's quite a loaded term, but actually this argues that the best thing you can do when it comes to leading others and succeeding is to love people, is to listen to them, is to watch them. It's not about telling them what to do. It's about, uh, it's, it's basically about supporting them as a person before their role. Um, and yeah, so, so do have a look at that. That's by Katie Granville Chapman and Emmy Bidston. Um, there's loads of articles online. There's a fantastic TED talk by Dr. Lucy Hone and there's more as well. Um, but there was one other thing I just wanted to mention, which is also by Oliver Berkman. And he talks about, it's been a while since I've read this book, so excuse me if I get this wrong, but don't get caught up on the noun. And what I mean by that is don't get, let's use the example of lawyer again. Um, if you spend your time thinking, I can't wait till I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. One day I'm going to be a lawyer. Well, then sure that's great um but how much time is it going to be before you get that stamp of feeling like you're enough whereas if you focus on the verb um you know i'm a performer i really love acting i love speaking right now i'm speaking so therefore i'm ticking my box of living my best life however am i acting right now have i got an agent have i have i got a contract am i on netflix no <laughs> am i an actor i don't know i don't care because I focus on the verb of doing what I love. So if you're reading, if you're writing, if you're researching, you'll find, like, just notice the verb and don't get caught up on status and titles, I guess. That's really good advice. So that first book is Leader, did you say? Leader by... Yes, Leader. And it's love, uh, no, and... Ooh, 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 ooh. No, love and inspire your people and that's katie granville chapman and emmy bidston oh, beautiful book and it I've says it's about one, leadership but it's, yeah go on i've got one um suggestion of my my own what you've been talking about reminds me of of a podcast which is quite popular i think um by elizabeth day and it's called how to fail and it invites mm -hmm. um celebrities on to discuss kind of their failures and how they've overcome them and how productive um their failures have been um, I think that's really worth checking out if, if anybody watching is interested in podcasts and stuff like that. I don't know if you Oh, definitely. 
I love the F word. I honestly, I actually have my favorite failures. I, I used to have a folder in my email where I'd collect all of my rejections and things like that. And I'd be like, yeah, um, that's awesome. Thank, thank you, Taylor. All thank right. Uh, so I think, oh, am I still sharing my screen? I don't want to. How do I do that? Oh, no. Wait for it. How do I? There we go. Ha ha. All right. OK, so now we are going to do a couple of exercises, which is really nice. And then we'll have some more time for questions. Um, so this first exercise I learned about from a lady called Julia Cameron, um, not from her personally, from her book called The Artist's Way. And um, that's a great one for resilience as well, uh, for any, especially if you enjoy indulging in your creative side. But this exercise is called Blurts and Affirmations. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend, hmm, I think just because of time, what we're going to do is we're going to do a shortened version of this. But I encourage you to repeat this activity when you're alone, when you've got some time to yourself, you've got some space. And the first part of the activity is you need a pen and paper. And all you're going to do is, you know, that nasty little voice that you have in your head. Uh, that we all have. If you don't have it, congratulations, skip this bit. Uh, but most of us have that horrible little gremlin that will tell us all sorts of things. So mine might say, oh, your nose is too big or you're ugly and you're not clever and you're bad at maths. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on of all the things that I'm bad at or not good at or, you know, the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask for <laughs> if you could do that for two minutes I've actually I'm going to get a timer up on here actually and share it with you lovely so you've had about 10 seconds <laughs> there we go lovely so just writing down down any bad self-talk that you can experience. Three, two, one. All right. So hopefully you now have a list of 10, maybe more, um, 10, maybe more of blurts, we call them. So those horrible niggly feelings. Um, now what you're going to do is hopefully you've got another piece of paper you can use. If not, you, you'll have to do a bit of origami and turn and fold things over. What we're going to do is we're going to take each sentence and we're going to convert it, so turn it into a new fabulous affirmation. So an affirmation is almost like a message of support. It's a statement of, yeah. So if I was using, so I think earlier, I can't, it's so funny what the subconscious does, isn't it? I said, oh, my nose is too big. I haven't thought my nose is too big in years. Maybe it is, I don't know. But I would say something like, my nose smells brilliantly, or my nose is beautiful. 
Uh, I, what else were some other things I said? Oh, I don't even know. But basically, I want you to write the opposite of that first statement. So if it was, I'm lazy, it would be, I'm hardworking, nobody likes me, I'm really popular and comfortable in my own skin. So you can be creative with it, but either way, you're taking that sentence and flipping it on its head. And I'm gonna give you another minute and 50 to do that now. Right. Okay. Oh, can you see me? Let me stop sharing that. There we go. I'm back. All right. So hopefully you now have uh, these brand new statements that are really positive that we call affirmations. Now, what I invite you to do is to take this piece of paper. You might want to spend some more time on it after this session or over the weekend and take this bit of paper and keep it near your bed. Now, I do all my work on a desk, which is which is in my room. Uh, so I keep mine there. But then I invite you to just look at those each morning for seven days. And if you're hardcore, you can look at it in the morning and the evening three times over. So you're just reading over them. And I find it most powerful to say those statements out loud. So just see if you can notice a difference. I really was quite amazed by the impact this had. It just changed the way I thought about myself and again about my days, not too dissimilar to the gratitude. Now because of time, we're not going to have time to do the mindfulness video, but that's fine because we've got loads on that on our Access 80 online program. However, I am just going to talk you very briefly through the open doors, closed doors exercise. Now this exercise, you should have a copy of this document coming to you soon if you don't have it already. But basically what I want you to do is you're going to think about a time where a door closed on you. So this could be a moment of rejection, a challenge, it might be not getting the results that you wanted, et cetera, et cetera. And with this activity, because of the context, let's not go too deep. Let's not think about the big life stuff. And we all have had tragedies and I'm very sorry if you've got anything recent, but don't uh, upset yourself. Do focus on something that you feel comfortable using for this exercise. Um, so you're gonna think about something in your past where a door has closed on you. And then what you're gonna do is you are going to then think about all the doors that opened for you after that. And I've got to say, this exercise is so powerful. For me, um, it's really funny, actually. My middle name is Mary, and I'm quite a happy person, I think. But I found out that my middle name translates as sea of bitterness. Like, not even just bitter, like an entire sea, an ocean of bitterness. And I thought, that's not me, is it? 
But actually, when I reflected on it, because quite a few of my plans have failed, I noticed I was getting a bit resentful and I was thinking, yeah, well, if only this had gone that way. And by doing exercises like this, I started to recognize that there are things that I would never trade, not for a million pounds, like these friends that I have that I've met through opportunities that went wrong and things like that, you know. Um, so I really hope this is a powerful exercise for you too, thinking about all the doors that opened and the opportunities you had as a result of that first door closing. There's also um, a lot of reflective questions that we've got for you um, to help you consider those answers and get the most out of that exercise. So you'll be getting that in your document soon. Now we are close to the close at the end of the session, but I have been told that it's absolutely fine if we run over slightly, which we would absolutely love to do if we have more questions, because you are the most important part of this entire program. So come at us. What do you want to know that we can offer? And my grandfather, by the way, always says advice is worth what you pay for it. So, you know, I don't know how valuable my advice is today to you, but uh, I hope I hope it's encouraging nonetheless. Taylor, have we got any questions? We've got one so far, which is quite an interesting one. It's about well, I'm going to I'm going to reword it. It's about how to be resilient in the moment. So <gasps> I think that I think what they refer to there is like if you're in a public speaking context what what methods can you use to overcome some of those self well those doubts that you might have about yourself and and to deliver a presentation do you know i'm so glad that's the question because it means i can dip into the mindfulness thing a little bit so i'm really really blessed um i ended up um working with an organization called mind fitness who are phenomenal do check them out and um, they taught me these techniques and we went into schools and, um, and organizations to teach them how to do exactly what you're asking. So you're absolutely right. If you are on stage and you've got hundreds of people looking at you and you've got this negative self-talk going on in your head, then of course you're gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna collapse. It's gonna be really, really difficult. But this method that I have learned changed the game. And so it's called STOP. And basically, it's all about allocating focus or choosing focus. And for me, I love it because it feels like going on a little holiday. And the more you do mindfulness, like any muscle, it generates new neural pathways in your brain. So it means it starts acting even quicker. So the more you do it, the easier it gets. That's basically it. But it doesn't take long to work at all. So what you do, the first thing you do is you notice you're freaking out. And I would say that's the first challenge ever with anxiety. I, I get anxiety and the first thing is actually stopping. It's kind of going, oh no, I, I'm spiraling or I'm panicking or I'm whatever, stop. So stop is an acronym, the first one, S, stop. That means if you're in an example, put your pen down. Even if you're driving, go park up, do, you won't be driving. Um, but you know, if you're playing football um, and you've just missed a goal, just stay still just for a second. You can afford it. T, take a breath. <sighs> Everything is all connected. And by increasing our lung capacity, we are maximizing oxygen to the brain and we're slowing down that stress response. It takes about four breaths, by the way, for the heart rate to slow, start slowing down. Um, so stop, take a breath observe now this is the most interesting thing you can observe anything using any senses but for the stop activity i recommend that you let your eyes fall upon the nearest thing so right now i'm looking at the keyboard in front of me and i invite you to do the same i'm going to ask you a series i'm going to ask you a series of questions and just answer them in your own head and we'll do this for about 30 seconds okay so with your eyes looking take another deep breath and you're just going to observe the thing in front of you so let your gaze fall and what colors do you notice can you see any dots what about lines Are there any shadows or light hitting it? 
What do you think it would feel like to touch? And noticing one last thing that you haven't noticed already. And P is proceed, so come back to me. So stop, take a breath, observe and proceed. That's in our mindfulness video. But the reason why it's so good is because once you've practiced it a few times, it, you basically, you're going on holiday, you're looking at an object and acting as though you've never seen it before. So you're exploring something right in front of you and it takes your focus and attention away from the fear, away from the paranoia, away from any nerves. And then you're back to what you're doing and you're, it, honestly, your shoulders feel lighter. So that's, that's one way, but yeah, so it's about grounding techniques. It's about being in the moment. Um, and, and the way to do that is through your senses. I could talk forever on this, but I, I shan't speak any longer, but thank you for that question. That was really great. Thank you. Taylor, have we got any others? We've got another really good question here, actually. So Lovely. it's a difficult one, um, but uh, this person says, how do I know if I should stop trying and try something else? What if it's not working for me? That's a really good oh, question. First of all, I feel you. I totally feel you. And I think that's a really, discernment is uh, the word for that, I think. It's, it's that, how do I make a decision? It feels like I'm, you know, swimming upstream. What, like, if I tried a little further, would I achieve it? Or do I just need to let it go? And I, I've got to say, I, <laughs> this is, it's so funny you say that question because I'm there right now. I'm currently crowdfunding for a project. We've got two or three days left and we're only at 25% of the target. Do I stay optimistic? Am I being delusional? I totally feel you. But um and this might sound a bit hippy dippy ish, but I'm afraid that's who you've got presenting today. Um, I would argue that you are your own expert. And whilst uh, our culture would encourage you to look outside of yourself and suggest that there is a best answer, you are the person that knows yourself best. So when it comes to your desires and what you're prepared to sacrifice, then you'll know the answer. Um, and also, like, so I met a, a fantastic chap called Tim Ferriss, who's really into productivity. And he's, he, he wrote the four hour work week, which is um, controversial in my mind. But the point is, is that he's really passionate about optimization and making the most out of things. And I said to him, how do I choose? Um, and he said, do the thing that keeps you up at night because you're so excited. So I would, yeah, I think that's my encouragement is I, for example, as you can tell, I'm speaking as part of my job now. I've tried to do jobs where I don't do stuff like this and it just doesn't work. I know that I love doing work like this. So just like it's like that for me, you'll have your equivalent of that because you won't be able to get rid of it. Um, so trust yourself. And also if, it, if the reason why you feel like you're depleted, maybe it's because you've been the, the thought has been right, but the application hasn't been. And what I mean by that is you've been staying up too late or cramming or, you know, I, I nearly, I really worked way too hard at the end of last year on this project that I think is now failing. And um, because I was insistent that I wanted it to be ready for January the 1st, 2020, for some reason. And I missed out on most of Christmas. I wasn't there presently because I was just hammering away and it led to exhaustion. So perhaps if I drank more water, if I would slept a bit more, you know, like, so be kind to yourself and just trust that, that you'll find out. Really good answer. And it, it speaks to another question that we've just got through, which was, and I'm not sure how comfortable you are with this question because it's a bit more personal. Um, That's fine. What was your greatest failure? Um, <gasps> oh my you, gosh, which one? How did you overcome it? And what did you learn from it? Do you know what? I this is this is probably wildly inappropriate, but I'll tell you about one of my most crushing moments. So, when it comes to my career, by the way, I've had tremendous failures. So I once had one of the best theatres in London, in my mind, that I had adored for ten years, offer to put my production on. They were like, "Yeah, we've gonna we're gonna give you a, a producer," um, but I the dates didn't work because I was in another show. And they said, well, can't do it then. And that that sucked. But the reason why I'm going to tell you this one is because it's so vulnerable. And I felt like that 
the person answering that question was going there and it's for me it is about recovery isn't it so I had been doing youth work for about seven years and there was this this person who I had always had a really good sense of humor with and we were always joking around and they phoned me on Christmas day and I was thinking oh that's a bit strange that they're phoning me on Christmas day and then I noticed I looked back through my diary I keep a diary and I'd been writing about them for weeks and I spoke to a couple of friends and I said do you know I think I think I'm in love with them and they were all of my friends all of our colleagues were going oh thank goodness you're like Ross and Rachel everybody knows and I'm like everybody knows so I phoned this (laughs) I phoned this person um while they were in India and said hi yeah just uh to let you know uh I think we've been quite shy and haven't really admitted our feelings and I'm ready to see that now um yeah and they saw (laughs) they literally were like oh nah and I was like oh okay um so they changed the subject and I said oh sorry can we go back a bit do you mind um are you sure that there's nothing romantic and he went oh yeah 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 you live in the friend zone now the reason why I'm telling you that story um isn't because relationships are more important than your career your career especially at your age should always come first because people are people will be there no matter what if you sacrifice your studies hmm but the reason why I'm using that as an example is because it really could have gone one of two ways. I could have been upset. I could have been angry, but I just felt really grateful that I've, I'd had the courage to approach that person. And that person, the last time I spoke to them was yesterday and we are still great, great pals. And you don't hear that very often. That's not an example you hear, but that was the most um that was one of the more emotional ones but when it comes to career failures I make them all the time and I recommend making them because it means that you're I'm the most productive person I know like hands down and by being comfortable with failure it means you're always moving and you get these incredible opportunities so yeah that was such a good response I don't think our viewers were expecting that but it's a really (laughs) good example of you know Failures happen um, and we recover from them, not just within our personal lives and academic lives, but throughout our lives. Um, And it's important to remember that. Um, I would have gave a much safer answer about like, I got a bad mark on an essay, but I uh, kudos to you for sharing that. (laughs) Um, I need to check if there's any other questions. Um, But we are running out of time. So we've got three minutes left. And I wanted to kind of ask if, if you had one piece of advice um, that was to summarize this workshop, um, what would it be? Do you know what? It's so funny. I'm probably going to give you some advice that not contradicts, but something that I wish I could transcend to every person. Um, Part of that is just the art of being in the moment. Um, I'm still learning how to do it, but every time I remember and give myself permission to be here right now, not thinking about the past, not projecting into the future, that is where, like now is where all of our power is. So that that would be, that I think is, is would be the wonderful thing to hand over. But just from what I'm hearing, I really, I really just want to say, I don't know, to someone here today or to everyone here today, um, don't underestimate the power of patience. Um, We live in a very, very fast world. And you folks, honestly, I love working with young people because you are already so resilient. You're already so brave. You're already so courageous. You're so funny. Um, But something that is just merely by environment I, I happen to have had the really wonderful opportunity to remember what life was like before the internet. And when the internet came and it was slow and it was rubbish. Um, and now that it's invasive and it's probably one of the biggest things in the world and we can't escape it a lot of the time. So I, I can only imagine that growing up in an environment that values convenience over the earth's resources, over humanity in many ways, just don't be afraid to wait um you will be amazed at the things that come to you when you just focus on looking after yourself um and you'll also get the best exam results if you 
panic in the exam room, do the stop technique. Literally, it sounds stupid. Look, look at the texture of the paper. And next thing you know, you've remembered that last bit of revision. So just give yourself permission to be in this moment and don't be afraid of patience. Amazing, really what good What about advice. you, Taylor? I know we've got to go, but have you got anything? <laughs> advice for kind of being resilient? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think, you know what? I think I'm still learning. I yeah. think your words really help. I don't think one of the myths about, uh, you know, growing up is that it becomes easier to, you know, fail. It, it never becomes easier, um, I don't think. But you do learn so many lessons from your failures. Um, mm. And it's important to remember that. We None of us are, um, it's easy to think that when you're at, you know, GCSE, A-levels, that all of your um, self-worth rides on a mark, but it doesn't. It's so little of it does. Um, not at all. So it's really, I, I remember like attaching so much weight to that kind of stuff when I really shouldn't have. So that's the kind of thing I take away. But like I say, I'm still learning, I think. I'm still learning to be more resilient. Um, but workshops like this, I wish I had when I was about 16 to, to learn from them um but yeah thank you to everybody who's been involved today and thank you ella for your your words of wisdom your your confessions your advice um and your tricks um i'm sure it's been really appreciated by all of you who've tuned in so um on behalf of uh, access he i just want to say thank you to ella um and to say goodbye to everybody who listened so thank you everybody and 